You've just entered the Disaster Tough podcast, the place for emergency managers, first responders, and humanitarians who want to get the job done. Stories, lessons, and tips are provided by field experts. I'm your host, John Scardina, owner of Doberman Emergency Management and former federal emergency response official who's responded to some of the most extreme disasters. Disaster Tough is our mantra. It combines experience, training, and analytics in order to be successful at any stage within the disaster life cycle. It means being a professional in emergency and disaster services. Doberman Emergency Management lives by this. If your organization needs to fill a gap, please contact us. We can help. Contact info is in the show notes. We also support other products and organizations that will increase your ability. For example, if you fight wildfires, hurricanes, a pandemic, any disaster in the field, at a hospital or command center, listen up. You're missing out if you do not use L3 Harris for your radio comms. They are secure, portable, mobile, and scalable, which is great news for us in the field. A truly disaster tough radio system. Check out the XL family of radios by clicking on the show notes or simply go to L3Harris.com. When you think of situational awareness, you need to think of Futurity IT. They are disaster tough because they saw a gap and figure out how to close it by creating the Orion and Athena applications. Situational awareness is all about speed, coordination, and accuracy of information. Futurity IT's Orion app collects and provides preliminary damage assessments and integrates all incident action plan documents with WebEOC. The Athena app allows for planning, contact tracing, and customizable group coordination in every single phase of the disaster lifecycle. The best part? Futurity IT made both applications extremely intuitive. It's so easy to use. Click on the show notes today to schedule a free demo. Welcome back to the show, everybody. It's your host, John Scardina. I am so excited for this episode. Man, we were, uh, last week, we were just watching The Last House Standing. It's a documentary all about emergency management and the principles of protecting critical infrastructure, especially housing. And so we actually have the man himself, the, the producer and director of The Last House Standing, the documentary, on our show today to talk about why he got into that what was his purpose of the documentary and to really encourage you to watch it because I'm a huge fan of the the documentary. You should watch it. George, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, John. Great to be here. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, of course. So let's just start from the beginning. The last house standing. I I know it's a, it was a New York times article. Were you involved in that process before the New York times article? Is that what kind of got you involved in, in thinking about the documentary? What was your, what was your reasoning behind that? Well, I've been, I've had this idea for 10 or 15 years. I mean, I came up with it a long time ago. I was working in uh, San Antonio, Texas, and I was working on some projects and I was thinking, I want to create something that would indicate something that lasts forever. Because I used to be in the news media and we would always cover stories where people would get wiped out, their house is destroyed, they lose everything and they rebuild. And then it happens all over again. And I thought, this is crazy. So I came up with this concept of let's make a documentary film about how you want your house not to have that happen to it, why you want to be the last house standing. And then the, um, the tragedy happened in Mexico Beach in 2018, and I got a hold of the gentleman who owned that house that was on the beach. And I said, let's do this and let's call it the last house standing. This is the true last house standing. And from there, we just uh, started, started running in different directions and getting all the different people we had in the film. And it all came together. What I loved about that house is like in the documentary, you're starting to walk through like how he built the house and it's not a bunker under the ground. It is a beautiful beachfront property that can withstand a hurricane. Like, Oh, that's what we want, right? We don't want people to have to live underground or think that they have to build these crazy bunkers. You can understand like the threats of your community and and you should build according to that. Right. And so well, that's that what was... they did. That, that's what LeBron Lackey, the gentleman who owns the house, did. He's a doctor. He's a very smart guy. And he, he looked at the code and said, all right, the code is great, but that's not going to help me if there's a category four or five hurricane that hits here. So they went above and beyond the code. And it shows what that can do when you look at everything around it. Everything else is gone. And that's, that's the only thing that's left. Yeah, it was pretty uh, stark to be able to see that. Um, the only closest thing I could think of to it was like a tornado 
And um, like by pure happenstance, if a tornado picks up, if anybody's been in a tornado response, like a, the, a tornado can go through a neighborhood and just wipe out everything. And there'll be only a couple houses left because it'll pick up in the way it moves. And what this was doing was saying, well, we could still be hit by that. We could still be hit by these, you know, hurricane force winds and still operate. And I loved how his, his big thing was, um, what was it? They made a hole for an outlet. And he was, he was peeved that this little section had come off on his house. Meanwhile, there it, it's just decimated around this guy. And I was like, man, this talk about a, talk about a, like a, the research project to say, Hey, this, this stuff works, you know? Well, you know how, and, and this happens to me every time I buy a house is you find something that you think might be a vulnerability or a problem. And inevitably it turns out to be the biggest problem you have. Like you buy a house and you go, this is a great house, but there's no closet space. And then you go to sell it. And everybody that comes through is looking for bigger closets. So on this roof of this house, there was one vulnerability. There was a, an outlet there and there was room for the wind to get in and mother nature found it. And he's lucky the whole roof didn't get ripped off. The house is really solid, but it, it found the weakest link and it exposed it. And that's, that's pretty amazing. I think that's always true of like any disaster. Like disasters exasperate vulnerabilities and it will, it will tell you what your gaps are. And it, it, you know, tell you what you're really good at. Obviously the last outstanding, duh. But it also shows you what you're worst at and it will show you in the most obvious way possible. Um, and so like that, again, just great call out there. So let's talk about like the filming process. Obviously at Brock Long on there, you had, uh, you know, several experts on there. What conversations to you were most impactful and, um, what would you want the audience to like take away from those conversations? You know, we had so many experts on there that had great things to say. There was a gentleman um, on there, Eris Papadopoulos, who wrote a book called Resilience, The Ultimate Sustainability. And, and Eris has so many memorable lines in the film where he talks about building codes and how builders lobby for lowest, lower standards because it, they can make more money. And everything that's counterintuitive to the person who's buying the house. You know, you're buying something yeah. and you're all excited about it. If you were buying a car and you found out that the manufacturers really didn't want to put brakes in it. They really didn't want to have airbags. They really weren't worried about things that could kill you. You might not buy that car, yet we buy the house anyway because it's decorated nice. It has pretty countertops and uh, uh, yeah. the latest uh, carpet or tile or whatever, they, wood floors. So Eris was amazing with the things he said. Brock Long, you've had him on your show. You know, that guy is so knowledgeable and has so much experience. And I, I told you, it was kind of funny when we sat down to do the interview with him, they were like, how did you guys get in here? We don't, we don't normally let filmmakers in here because everybody wants to blast FEMA and go after them because they're like the organization that is there for you. But if something goes wrong, everybody's going to pounce on them. Yeah. And I made it clear to them, look, we're not pouncing on anybody. We want to just talk to people and find out how we do things better. So Brock was terrific. Um, we met a professor at George Washington University that was, that was great. And all our experts, if you watch the film, have an area of expertise that brings out why it's a problem when a disaster strikes, whether it's climate change, global warming, building codes, tornadoes, everything. And so, you know, that's what makes it interesting to watch because you're getting hit from all these different directions. Like, I didn't think of that. I didn't think of that. And we really need to think of everything. Yeah. So it, the, the one about FEMA cracks me up because people always pounce on FEMA. But people, FEMA's like, hey, you're moving into a flood zone. Hey, 40% of the U.S. population is headed towards the coast. And the other thing that like really like gets me about building codes, especially with natural disasters, it's, it's repetitive by nature. Like that's, it's, it is nature. Like that is, that, that is the process of nature. It's all about patterns. Right. And, um, you know, even with earthquakes, you know, might not be a pattern, but there is a buildup over a period of time. That period of time is very extensive, but eventually it's going to pop. That's what, fault lines do and so it's like just to ignore that to, to play this game of well i know it happens in this area but i don't want to focus on it um was it's just it's just amazing to think about and so it's it's nice and refreshing to hear as a guy who used to be in fema you know you you see brog long with like the, the fema the shirt on and he's like hey here are your problems and you're going to keep having problems and we can't address that it's going to outpace us and it is outpacing us. And I was like, yes, that is, that is exactly right. Like we can be the, 
we can be the absolute best. And I'm pretty arrogant. I believe I am one of the best at my job, but I can't fight nature if you don't prepare for nature. And it, you know, I, I've been to so many disasters where it's like it go into a neighborhood and everyone's in shock. You know, PTSD is just climbing, you know, exponentially. And you're like, man, this, this could have been prevented. Like that is, that's like that pain point for me. I don't know. And most disasters, there's something you could have done to prepare better. You know, it was really telling one of the things that Brock talked about was at FEMA, people always come to them and argue that they don't want the flood level raised from eight feet to nine feet or nine feet to 10 feet. And they'll, they'll argue and question that. And it's like, they're giving you data that shows what could happen to you. You need to prepare for it. And people would fight that, you know, building codes are, it's another great example. You know, builders are, are trying to save as much money as possible. They're in a business. And so how do you change that conversation? Well, we have to demand more as the public. We have to ask, you know, how much safety thought did you put into this? How will my, will my house survive these disasters? You know, I live in um, Tampa, Florida, and so many structures here on the second floor are still being built with wood. And there's an apartment complex down the street that's all wood from the ground floor up. Jeez. And you're going, well, this is a hurricane bullseye area. Everybody says Tampa is due for a major hurricane. Yeah. Yet they still continue to do that. And that's a human psyche thing. It's like, I have neighbors that don't have generators. They don't really have a plan for hurricanes. They go, we'll just evacuate. I don't think they've ever read their insurance policy to know whether they're even fully covered because there are different exclusions in an insurance mm. policy, depending on what the disaster is. So people just live aimlessly, assuming everything is going to be okay. And there was a great um, quote in our film by uh, Joseph Barbera, the professor from George Washington, where he said that he used to work in uh, emergency management. He said, hope is not a strategy. I love that. I love line. that so much. Yeah. I, in fact, we, I think at one point in one of the agencies was working out, that was up on the wall. Is that a good, it's a good like emergency management statement. Let's back up though for a second because you're talking about like the, the car analogy. And I loved how the documentary they were like, hey, they, the actual car industry knew this problem for like 10 years, right? They knew that seat, seat belts save lives and it came down to cost and it was quote unquote nominal. So it wasn't needed until really the, uh, the, the policy was changed to force, uh, you know, force. Uh, uh, like safety belts in cars and now we have better airbags and there's all these safety measures in place. And so like my question to you is after interviewing so many people and, and focusing on this for so long is uh, I have this constant struggle be between one, the consumer needing to demand it. And most people, you're right. Like they look at the, they look at the floors. They don't think about the code. They don't look at really look at their insurance policy. I will say that after watching, I watched it with my wife. She was like, we should review our insurance policy. I was like, oh, trust me, our insurance policy is pretty strong. But yeah, we, could, we should check it out. And so it was just cool to see her. You know, she's a designer. Like her, that's her, she, I like to say, like, she likes to focus on why the world is beautiful and make the world more beautiful. I like to focus on, like, the destruction of the world and how to, like, save it. It's kind of funny. But, um, like, really good call out there about that. So what do we do? Like, how do you, how do you deal with the consumer side? But how do you also try to help? policymakers when there's so many lobbyists forcing it the other way? Well, look at the climate of the world politically. You know, if, if I look at the sky and see blue and somebody else sees green and they're dug in on that, we're not having a conversation. I mean, is it, where do you go from there? And, and so everybody mm -hmm. fights over everything. It takes a long time to change a code or to change things. You know, we focused on more Oklahoma in the film because of all the tornadoes that hit them. And I think it was 2014, they changed the building code to make it stronger. And it added about a dollar 50 to $2 a square foot for construction to build a house where the garage was safer, just the, the way the house was fastened down, mm -hmm. that would make it more survivable for a, a tornado. But they even said, I asked a builder in the, in the film, whose job is it to demand more? Is it the, the builder to build better or the buyer to demand more? And he says, it's up to the buyer because the builder mm -hmm. could build it and then you might not want it and then they're stuck with it. So in more, they changed the building code so you had to build the house to a higher standard and it makes a major difference, but it takes a long time to do that. So if you're in construction now, or you have a house and you, there's things you can fix, you need to be your biggest advocate because 
you don't have the luxury of waiting. You know, the, the city mm. can wait 10 years and change things. But if the storm comes next year and there's, they haven't done anything, but there's things you could have done personally to fix it, th then it's kind of on you. I mean, you can't fix everything. There's some disasters that are going to nail you no matter what. You know, um, one of our experts says if a EF5 tornado hits your house, there's probably not much you can do. And then that's where you hope you have insurance. You had a storm cellar. You know, you did other things that would mm -hmm. that would make that less bad. But if you're on the fringes of that, if you're a half a mile away and you have a safer house, your roof might not blow off. Your walls might still be intact. So you got to focus on what you can do. And we have to demand more. We have to challenge builders. I've had a lot of frustrating experiences with builders over the years because Me too. house is a very personal <laughs> thing. You know, yeah. it's just, I've had, you know, like one thing for sure, I'm a clean freak. And if you go to a lot of job sites, they're dirty. A lot of workers toss their lunches into the walls before they seal them up. Um, there's trap, you know, it's just certain things that drive me nuts because that's my house. Mm. And so nobody's going to care more than you. So if you're building a house, you should be out there all the time. You should yeah. find out who the job foreman is on the job and how he's working his crew because it's only going to be as good as that guy watching everybody. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've had houses where I, I, I get there and the, the foreman goes, hey, it's my last day. I'm leaving. And I'm going, oh, man, we're screwed. <laughs> so you have to kind of be on everything. You really do. I was so when I was in uh, college, I, um, I put up the large signs you would see like at like the Walmarts or the McDonald's. I, I did that um, part time. And then I switched over to a construction crew. Cause I, I can understand wiring. I can understand basic electrical and the, the foreman who I worked was worked for was OCD. I mean, he, to, to, and I don't mean that lightly. I mean like, and it had to be absolutely perfect. And I was really grateful to learn what perfect looked like because we would, we would walk onto a job site and he would just, he'd basically lose it. Right. Like people cutting corners left and right. And, uh, you know, he was always fighting like the cost versus doing it right. And so like you, you have this problem too. So like when we went and bought our house four years ago, because I have a little bit of background in it, I started working on things. But then I got too busy for work and I hired a couple of guys out. And by the end of like day one, I was like done. I was like done with them. I was like, you, you're so bad. Like you've been doing this for years and yet you're so absolutely terrible at this. And, um, I, I think it's, I think it's important to, um, to call that out on the other side of it though. It's like, I think we need to have a better expectation of, of what their skill sets are. Like these guys are, you know, often working 12 to 14 hours a day, tight deadlines to try to get things done. And if they don't understand why something's important, they're not going to do it. Oh, I only need to put three nails here. Not instead of four nails, like it's up, it's fine. It's not good. Like they, they, they move it with their hand, right? Oh, you know, it's not moving, so it's fine. Mm -hmm. And I think there needs to be, a, you know, several facets of teaching of like why these things are important, you know? Well, not just it's hard to labor. instill pride in, in people. And this isn't to knock the entire industry because there's a lot of amazing houses. There's a lot of great builders. There's a lot of builders that really care about what they do. But the process of building a house, where to me it gets tricky is, you have the builder, but then there's the subs that they bring in to do everything around the build. And where mm -hmm. are they going to make extra money? Obviously saving money on the people that come in to do it. So the guy that does the driveway may not be the best driveway guy in town because he was a dollar a square foot less than the other guy. And the yeah. guy that does the landscaping, he's probably the lowest bid. Maybe the guy that does the pool, maybe the guy that was the framer just happened to be the lowest bid on that job. So you want to make sure they have a crew that they work with on a regular basis and that low bid isn't helping you as the buyer of the house, because if you're just to use a number, a hundred thousand dollar house, I don't know where you can find a hundred thousand dollar house. <laughs> so that's the cost you're getting charged, no matter who they bring in to finish it, unless they call it an upgrade, right? Mm -hmm. So along the way, you want to make sure that they're not making an extra ten thousand dollars because they brought in a guy that uh, was framing houses for a hobby. You know, it's just you don't know that stuff, and all the stuff we don't know is usually the stuff that that bites us later when our roof leaks or there's cracking or mm -hmm. um, just little stuff. And it just drives me nuts because if I put that kind of attention into my job, nobody would ever hire me. I would, it just doesn't yeah. work. I, I looked at my film 
And I'm telling you, every day I changed something because I, I, I have OCD too. Eventually I had to say, okay, this is it. I, I'm not going to work on this because you can always make it better. But there should still be a certain standard of what people can expect when they live in a house. You should be able to have that. That's an excellent, excellent point. I think it applies exactly to emergency management. Um, you know, if you're building your house, you can easily call that an analogy for uh, building an emergency plan or working with their different community partners. Having a plan is everything and having like what we would call courses of action. You have a course of action. I was just talking about this with somebody in the last 24 hours, actually. Course of action. Hey, this is what we want to do. You have this overarching goal, build a house. Here are all the objectives. This is like the metrics for success. And so whether it's making a movie or creating an emergency plan or responding to a hurricane, I've done plenty of those. You have to go in there knowing like what your objectives are um, based off your courses of action. And um, like, just, just to pull back for a second, I love the documentary. So wherever you decided you wanted to stop was perfect because uh, <laughs> people like me who look at it all the time, I do look at this stuff all the time. That is my job. And yet I was really excited, not just to watch it, but at the end I was like, yeah. So like, I was like all fired up about it. I was like, we need to like get stronger building codes. And I was like going down this list and my wife was like, oh my gosh, just go to bed already. Um, so like, it's a great documentary for that reason alone. It allows people who are currently in the field to be able to apply it still. And, and instead of like one of these high level things that doesn't really get into like the meat of why. And you really talk about the meat of why. The more Oklahoma, you talk about that quite a bit. What was fascinating to me is like, I've done several tornado responses where we had to go back to the same location. In fact, uh, Patrick McGinn on his episode, his last one, he was on the show. He talked a lot about having to go back to the same locations. And so I, I would encourage people to listen to that one, but um, I've done that too. And it's phenomenal that in, in the documentary, you're like, hey, this has already happened several times before they did the building codes. And still there was reluctancy in the community and that blows my mind because I grew up with tornadoes. I hate tornadoes. Like you hear that sound of a freight train or you hear those sirens go off. You don't want to deal with that. Like, I don't want to lose my house, you know? It's, well, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's phenomenal. In 1998, when I was a, a weatherman in San Antonio, Texas, and I had to go up to cover the tornado damage that happened in Moore. And I interviewed a woman who the only thing left on the slab where her house was and only thing within a block radius was her bathtub and a mattress that she held over her to keep her from getting sucked up by the tornado. Everything else was scraped clean. And first of all, the, the, the victims, when you talk to people like that, I mean, obviously they're shocked. They're just, they just had a near death experience and, and were able to survive. But I said, why didn't you have a storm cellar? And she just said, we didn't want to spend the money. And so when we were in more this time, a storm cellar averages between 3,500 $5,000, you can have some kind of storm cellar. And if you factor that into a 15 year mortgage or a 30 year mortgage, I promise you that's a more important thing to have than the upgrade in your car, or maybe mm -hmm. the, there's something you could give up to have that, that could keep you from getting killed. Yet, I think it's 30% or less of the people in Oklahoma actually have storm cellars. And that's, that's like surprising. Tornado Alley. Yeah, it's yeah. nuts. It is, it's crazy. So well, then I guess that best begs the question of what now? What do you want people to take away from the documentary, especially those in the field? I want them to see the film and go, okay, I may not be able to change the law tomorrow, but I'm going to do something. And that may start with taking pictures of everything in your house. So if your house is destroyed, you have proof that you had the things that you lost. I hadn't done that in, until before last hurricane season because I kept putting it off. So I finally yeah. walked around my house and took a picture of everything because the insurance company is not going to take your word for it. Yeah, George, you had the 75-inch uh, TV when you actually had a little tiny TV. They're going to want to see everything. And so yeah. you, you, you can do that right away. You can understand if you're building a house, what are the risks in the area where you live? Um, what do you need to be concerned about? In Houston, from Hurricane Harvey, I think most of the people that were wiped out and damaged by that flood didn't even live in a flood zone. And they could have bought flood insurance for I think three or 400 bucks, but they never thought mm -hmm. of it. 
And Brock Long said in our film, if it rains where you live, your house can flood. So that should be a, a wake up call for you. So there's something everybody can do. You can hire an inspector to come out and look at your attic and tell you how tight the envelope is of your house, how secure your roof is bracketed to the, to the walls, how the walls are bracketed to the foundation. Understanding those elements that might be your weakest link and then having a plan for it. If you live in a fire zone, you know, this is one that you've probably dealt with um, before, I'm sure, where if somebody said you have 10 minutes to evacuate your house, just grab some stuff. I guarantee you, you'd probably spend most of that time thinking about what you wanted to grab. You'd go, gosh, where's this, where's that? <laughs> but so this woman, um, Carolyn Carradine, that we interviewed in Malibu, their house was completely destroyed, had a go box by the, in a closet by the door, and there's a list of things to grab when you know you have to evacuate. So if there's birth certificates, passports, the journal that your great grandfather gave you, your kid's baby shoes, you know what you need. You have 15 minutes, 10 minutes, you take something important. And then you're that much more ahead of the game. So mm -hmm. what we learned with every victim we talked to, there's something they could have done. Sometimes you can't avoid it and it's just, it's horrible. Um, but there's still things you can do. So I'm going to do some uh, self-promoting here because I agree with you 100%. So on our website, DobermanEMG.com, we have a couple different documents. One is free. We, we developed a document that lists out exactly that. Like, here's everything you'll want. First of all, insurance, number one. But, you know, listing out important documents, um, putting insurance information, putting medical information on there. That's really important. Um, you know, all these policy numbers and just, I, I put together basically like a, a, a 10 page PDF where people could simply fill out in under an hour. And all it does is it's, it's in the, by your door in your go bag and you pull it out real quick. And so you don't have to do any thinking. I agree with you a hundred percent. Most people just like, sit they're like, okay, now what? Or even worse, they go back to what they know because that's what, how people do when they're in shock is they is they do what they've always done. And if you do what you've always done, that means getting on social media. So in those 10, 15 minutes, they're sending out a tweet or they're putting something on Facebook saying, I just got evacuated. Like, oh my gosh, like, don't do that. You know, and just like a little bit of training of like what those documents to do. So that, that document's free. And then what we also do is we, we call it a, a home hazard vulnerability assessment. And I'm sure all my competitors are going to take this from me now and that's fine. Uh, just want to help people out. But basically what we do is we go in there and we assess all your risks. So if you have like, for example, a city planner who tells you about the, about your town, if you have all these different people who are providing to you information about what your house is, we go in there and say, here's your hazards. This is likely to happen. This is not likely to happen. Here are the gaps to overcome those problems. And it's a, it's a fairly straightforward, like basically a map book that says, this is exactly what your problems are. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are shocked to learn these things. Like um, I had a friend who was thinking about buying a house. And so he said, hey, can I, can I get that from you? And I said, sure. And I said, hey, ha for half the year, you're going to be dealing with a factory that's blowing, uh, you know, um, a sewage plant actually uh, blowing towards your home. So you're looking at the home right now that smells really great. Uh, no problem. But the other half of the year, you have the wind pointed in your house. And so you're going you're gonna to smell like manure for half a year. And uh, just like understanding like that, like your level of comfort uh, is huge. And, um, and I could talk about that all day, but yeah, a hundred percent, like knowing what your problems are. And quite frankly, it does come down to the responsibility of the individual. Like if you live in a, in a hazard zone, if you've chosen to live in a place, especially if you have the means to be able to choose uh, where you live, then it is, re you're responsible to figure out what your problems are and mitigate those problems. Having a generator is obvious for most places, you know. Most people don't have them, you know, and that yeah. creates an interesting scenario. You know, my wife and I have talked about this. It's like we have a generator. So a major hurricane hits your area. Everybody's without power for two or three weeks. Do you invite all your friends over? Absolutely not. You know, but you could lose a lot of friends. There was a Twilight episode, yeah. episode about that with the bomb shelter. And all the neighbors mm. broke into the bomb shelter because they figured that was their neighborhood and they had a right to be in there. And it mm. exposed the weakness of the neighborhood because people really do think disaster is not going to happen. 
and they're willing to take the risk of completely having their life turned upside down because they don't think it's going to happen. And that was the scene we had in the film from The World According to Garp. Remember where the airplane crashes into the house and Robin Williams looks at the realtor and goes, we'll take it. We'll take the house. Oh, I know that scene. I know that scene. And you, uh, yeah. Yep. Do you realize um, the odds of a plane ever hitting this again? And that's what led into our film Tomorrow, Oklahoma. Well, it did happen again and again and again. Yeah. Yeah. So and it will happen again. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to be ready for anything. It was another interesting thing. When we moved to Tampa, my wife and I were looking at houses. Most people don't talk to neighbors in a neighborhood. Every time we're walking around and we see realtors showing houses, the people just look at us and we smile and wave when, when, we, when they go by. We were looking at one house and I said to a neighbor was walking by, I said, tell me about the flooding here. And he said, every time it rains, the water gets up to the front door of that house. We didn't even go in and look. We figured, <laughs> okay. And so really you, have to, <laughs> yeah, was. you have to talk to people because that's your best source yeah. of information. If you're going to buy a house, go around and talk to everybody in the neighborhood because they'll tell you what the risks are. They'll tell you what goes on there. And you almost have to be, you, you clearly have to be your biggest advocate. You have to do the, put in the work. And most people don't want to do that because we don't think that disaster is going to happen to us. Well, disaster, it's, it's the, the mentality is changing, right? Because um, like my thesis in college is all about, um, I, I had this question. I said, are disasters actually happening more often or are we just aware of them now with, uh, you know, because of communication technology? And so I was able to basically prove that, yes, they are happening more often. You can basically see, see from 1990 on, uh, there's been a steady increase in uh, velocity and impact of disasters because basically people are moving into those areas, one, and they are getting stronger. We have stronger storms than we've had. So there is that problem. But the, the mentality is changing, too. It's like active shooters. If you look at the, the true statistic of active shooters, they're very rare, extremely rare, right? But because of news media, we think they happen all the time. And that is also perpetuating why they're happening more often. So we don't even want to get into that. But uh, it just shows that like that awareness is changing. Like documentaries like this are helping change that awareness. Um, let's talk about two recent events that apply exactly to this. The most recent would be what's happening in Texas, yeah. right? In 2017, I don't know if I can say this on the air, but I'm going to anyways. In 2017, after Hurricane Harvey, I said, you have a problem with supply. You don't have supply. You have an increase of people who want that supply. You talk about people with generators. Let's talk about trying to pump gas when you don't have electricity to be able to pump that gas. We can get into that. But like there, there, was, there was little redundancy. And so when I was on social media, some emergency managers were calling it a black swan, which means that nobody predicted it was going to happen that this was known for years. We knew about this for years. And when I went in there, I said, Hey, you have to, you have to address this. And you know, it's no shock to me that when they have a winter storm, everybody pumps up the, the natural gas. They don't have enough supply. They have to kill the system real quick, or they were going to lose everything. And then when they kill the system, everything freezes. Like those are, those are redundancies that they could have mitigated. You know? so you're, looking, you're looking at it from an expert's perspective, and, not, and now I'll give you the other side of it. That storm was not a surprise to everybody that lived there. It should not have been. My wife and I, because we moved here from Texas, a week out, we were looking at the weather going, oh, God, we're so glad we're not there. Our friends are going to get just pummeled. They're going to have this. They're going to have that. My son lives in Austin, Texas. I told him, hey, you're going to have a major storm coming. Are you ready? And most people thought, because earlier in the season, they had a threat of this kind of weather and it didn't happen, they're going, that's not going to be that bad. So from the consumer end, people didn't stock up on groceries. People didn't stock up on batteries. They didn't have firewood for their fireplace. So all the things they needed that could have made it more bearable for them, it's still miserable when you're without power for that amount of time, they didn't do it because they didn't think it was going to be that bad. Mm -hmm. And that is a problem also, because it happens in a hurricane season. When you get evacuated early in the season for a storm and it ends up missing you, when they issue the evacuation the next time, you're going, oh, well, we didn't have to go last time, so we're not going to hassle with going this time. And then you get pounded by the storm. So you have to have the commitment, if you're, if you're in a risky area, to be prepared and take it seriously. Worst case scenario, you have some extra food around if you bought 
um, things that aren't going to spoil or you have extra water lying around or extra batteries. I would rather have that than have to go through it without it. Mm -hmm. You know, you, firewood's not expensive if you buy it when you don't need the fire. Um, you know, there's a lot of things you point. can do. And people did not take that seriously from a preparation standpoint. The debate mm -hmm. about how ready the state was, come on, it's obvious they weren't. It's a disaster. They got a lot to do. But that may take years to figure out. So now every person there is charged with, well, what can I do to make it less bad on me next time? Mm -hmm. And that's going to involve being prepared and not saying, oh, the media is wrong all the time. The weather guy is wrong all the time. I tried to explain to my son, yeah, they're wrong on whether it rains or snows, freezing rain or snow. But they're usually not wrong about cold air dropping down. That's usually a little more of an accurate forecast. And so you can count on it being very cold. And it was. And so, <laughs> you know, as a former weatherman, I know that you don't usually miss as much on the temperature as you do on the precipitation. I, um, yeah, that's, <laughs> I had a, I had a, uh, oh man, it was a long time ago. I had an episode, I think it was called, there's no such thing as um, the boy who cried wolf in emergency management. Like emergency managers, people don't get this. Emergency managers want to be wrong. Like if we say like this major disaster is going to happen, nothing would make us happier than a major disaster not happening. Right. But people don't understand like science and, and then, and data, you, you have to go with what's best available. Like, well, I'll go into a community talk about weather. Weather is hilarious to me because like, we have done so much to try to figure out weather patterns and the lame, the, you know, the, the average person will be like, well, why don't we don't understand you know, perfect weather? You know, like, Oh, do you understand quantum physics? Like this is, it's, it becomes con pretty complex when you, when you think about all these dis different systems interacting with each other, these different environments and we're still trying to figure out, and yet we've made so much headway in it. Um, man, that's, that's hilarious. Yeah, we know when it's going to be cold. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. Yeah, I would say you're right. But it's not an exact science. You know, weather is not an exact science. Hurricanes move all the time. They change at the last second. Hurricane Michael, a lot of the people we spoke with thought they were riding out a Category 2, and they could have done that quite easily. And overnight, it strengthened, and it hit them as a Category 5. So yeah. what's the lesson there? It's like, if you can't ride it out where you are, you got to leave. And that's the price you pay. But if, you, if you're proactive instead of reactive, you're always going to be better off in the end. And we're not. We're a reactive society. We wait till something bad happens. Then we get mad that we can't fix it right away. And people are letting us down and not helping us. But if you had been proactive, you might not have had to bend in that line. You might not have had to. Once you become a, in, in that victim state, you need other people to come through for you. And, and those people have it really tough. I mean, Mexico Beach, it could be, who knows how long it's going to be till that gets rebuilt. Um, and yeah. so you gambled if you lived there and you, and you lost big time, unless you were the last house standing. There was a, what was it? The mayor of that town or it was like when he said, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine what three hours would have done to this community. If you knew. And first, my heart just kind of ached for the guy when he said that. And that was a good line that you had on the movie. Got me. But uh, at the same time, like, I immediately, I did one of, like, the, like the, one of these where I grasped my head, like, what? You, did, you live in a hurricane-prone area, and you didn't know what a hurricane could do to your community? It's probably because they had so many misses, right? They, and that's a call out for us, too. I mean, yes, it's not an exact science. Yes, we want to be wrong. Yes, these things happen. But it, it, there is fatigue. And every time that there's a possible event and we say, oh, it's going to be the worst, and it's not, then we have to take responsibility a little bit of saying, okay, like there's a reason why people weren't paying attention here. And uh, maybe we're, we're part of that reason. Well, Hank Ovink, who was in the film, he was a water, bas water ambassador of the Netherlands. Um, President Obama brought him in after Hurricane Sandy. And I saw him on 60 Minutes. And I go, I got to get this guy for the film. It took a, a year to get this guy. But he's phenomenal. And he talks about how much do you want to bunker your community? How much are you willing to go to make sure your community survives? Or do you have a slightly lesser standard? And then you know you can rebuild after a disaster. Well, in Mexico Beach, they got hit by a Category 5 hurricane. But they're rebuilding. And the new code is for 140 mile an hour winds. 
So the wins that wiped them out, if it happened again, even if they rebuild to the new code, aren't going to be good enough. Mm. And so in South Florida, the wind code is for a category five hurricane. That's the standard you have to build to. So they're more likely to survive. So you make your choice. But what also what Hank said in the film that really stood out to me is how a disaster is like an MRI or an X-ray of your community. And now you get to see your weakest points. What are you going to do to act upon those points now? Well, Texas sure knows what they need to do. They got to figure out the power system. What a disaster. And yeah. Florida, there's a lot of cities and communities that have a lower code. Tampa, Florida, we're, if we get hit by a major storm, downtown's going to be under 20 feet of water. Um, they said at the time they did a, a, t a scenario called the Hurricane Phoenix scenario in 2010. The population ha has stored since then. And at the time, they said half a million homes and businesses would be destroyed yeah. by a major storm. So it's, it's eye opening. So we all need to, you know, hopefully people will watch the film and go, okay, doing nothing is not okay. Let's do something. Ah, love that. That is the line. I'm going to, that's the quote. That's the quote of the show. You have to do something. something doing nothing yeah. is worthless. Um, Hurricane Harvey, I, I've always talked about that one. It's a really impactful event for my career. I probably should talk about other ones from now on, but we had 700,000 homes that had, um, that had impact. And, um, you know, an unprecedented storm where it's coming in there. I hate that word now after COVID, but we had this uh, storm that come in here and just sit there for a few days. It just sat on the state and uh, stayed at Category 4 for several days. That's going to be major impact. Um, man, there's, so let's, man, I, I can't want to talk about all these different events. Let's talk about two more events, and then I'm, we're probably going to call it good. But uh, the second one I was thinking of was last week, a big fan of Japan. Uh, and what they've done with building codes is they had a 7.1 magnitude earthquake right off the shore of Tohoku and like almost no, like there was no impact. Like it was barely even made the news. And I was like, if you have a 7.1 magnitude earthquake happen in Haiti, happen in the United States, even we had a six point, what was, what was that? 6.3 in Southern California. And there was a ton of damage down there last year. Building codes matter, right? Like, Japan has done so many things to, to relieve that system that they can have these major, you know, earthquakes. And it's like, eh. So like, that's why like 2011, I think I talked about this on the show before too. When I got a, I got a text that saying there was an earthquake in Japan. I like saw that at like three or four o'clock in the morning on my phone. I was like, who cares? Yeah, they're fine. And, uh, you know, I got all, I started getting more more text messages about the tsunami. And uh, then I was like, oh, shoot, you know, and so like they have done so well mitigating at least uh, earthquakes. And now they're trying to work on mitigating tsunami. Uh, it just it just shows that this stuff matters, you know, like everything you're talking about in your documentary matters. It matters to consumer and it matters, uh, it matters on a on a national scale as well. It does. And our uh, uh, earthquake expert, Kit Miyamoto, in the film talks about how few buildings in California are built with the base isolation technique that would mm -hmm. have the building roll and survive. And he said that if a major uh, earthquake hit San Francisco, half the buildings would be uninhabitable. And he said that when they're building those buildings, they've made the decision that it's a lot less money. How long is the building going to be around? What are the odds that the big one's going to hit? And if it's destroyed, we can just build it again. That's a great industry. If you know that, wow, I can build this house for this person. And if it's, just, it's destroyed, I'll just build it again for them. Well, that may be good for you, but if it's my house, I'm not happy with that. <laughs> and yeah. it's like, really? You'll just, thank you. You'll rebuild my house. I think that would be my cue. Maybe that you're not the guy I'm going to go to next time because your house didn't survive. But it's, it's that mentality. And, and so... I just am blown away by that. I grew up in California. I don't even like visiting there now um, because I was always, I lived, I was in San Francisco for the 89 World Series earthquake. Mm. I thought the whole stadium was going to collapse. I was on the top deck. And oh my I gosh. hate earthquakes because you can't, you know, a, a hurricane, you know, it's coming. Tornado, you hopefully get at least a few minutes. Earthquake, nothing. Yeah. You're, you're done if you're in the wrong spot. The movie Twister when um, the, they're watching the outdoor movie and all of a sudden they, sh they turn on their car lights and the twister's right there. I'm like, that's pretty unrealistic. Um, 
I've seen but that yeah, movie twenty times, by the way. I, <laughs> uh, I kind of hate that movie because I hate tornadoes, but that's funny. Um, talking about base isolation. So the largest, as far as I'm aware, this is probably still true. The largest snowplow contract in the United States, a memorandum of understanding MOU, is for San Francisco, because we did an analysis that um, yes, most of the buildings would stay standing, but all the glass is not made to deal with the swing and you'd have up to four feet of glass in the streets of, of uh, San Francisco if they had you the same the nine point. The wow, yeah. And funny. so how do you get first responders into uh, an area that has four feet of glass? Like you, first of all, you don't want them to be walking over that, even if it's tempered, even if they have all these other things, because anything could happen. Um, and like, how do they physically get in there? Four feet of glass. So, yeah, it's just pretty, uh, pretty interesting to think about that aspect of are we, we, we have uh, basically San Francisco and kind of uh, Oakland, they're glass cities. I don't like going there anymore either because all I see is the glass. All I see is like, oh, like even if I'm okay, there's no way I'm getting out for a very long time as every snowplow for the western half of the United States is trying to come in there and remove uh, glass, let alone if there's other disasters happening around the country and they can't even get out there. So just, just really wild to think about, you know, you know, it's interesting. You talk about snow plows for cleaning up glass. Well, Texas, but there may be one snow plow in the entire state of Texas <laughs> because it's not cost effective to have it. When we lived in San Antonio, yeah. that rare time it snows, you wait for it to melt. Why would you keep a, a supply of snow plows around? for that rare occasion. But what you're talking about is really interesting, having it for glass. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, they, yeah, exactly. And so like talking about Texas again, they were talking about bringing in generators from FEMA. They brought in 60 generators to support the hospitals and nursing homes. And I was like, why didn't the hospitals and nursing homes have generators as part of their, part of the code? Uh, California does require, they gave, nursing homes in California three years to create a continuity of operations plan, which included generators and the storing of fuel, especially if they have resident populations. Like some of them are just basically daycares, right? Um, but like, what do you do? There was a story of a delivery driver showing up to somebody's house, got her, her, her car got stuck and she stayed with the family for five days. Like there's um, just like understanding that, but uh, I always talk about Brock Long, obviously, way too much, probably. He probably rolls his eyes at this point. but thinks You're stalking him. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, exactly. He said um, he said on the show that people have a problem with asset poverty. You could be making six figures, but you're so strapped that you, you don't have any redundancy anyways. Like, you, you can't afford the insurance. You can't uh, move forward in that. So I think this is like a good call out for that as well. You talked about how... Uh, you, you asked that question. It was kind of a rhetorical question, but I answered it anyway. It's like, if, if the power goes out for three weeks, is everybody coming over? And I said, no, absolutely not. Because there should be built redundancies in the communities. Again, going back to Texas, built a uh, redundancy in the community that community centers should be able to have backup power and be able to warm people up. Um, in fact, they, they had a big story with that where a may mayor was frustrated and he basically said all this really stupid stuff like, the government's not here to help you. Like that's kind of the point of government. Um, but uh, like people were, the frustration came because people just wanted to warm up in um, the community facilities because they still had power. And I think we need to better, better understand those, um, like those thought processes there and, and be able to work with survivors who are at their max as well. So yeah, a generator is a lot more expensive um, a purchase than a storm cellar. You know, you can get a storm cellar, as I said, for 3,500 bucks, 4,000 bucks, depending on the size of your house, a generator could be anywhere from 10 to 20, $30,000. But once again, in my thought process, if you factor that in to a mortgage or you find some way to finance it, the problem is, and this happens, you probably hear these stories with insurance. We interviewed a guy in our film who had old collector cars in his garage and they weren't running. So he took the insurance off of them because he figured he wasn't going to be using them. They melted in the fire. It's, it's like you have to, you can't look at it as, well, I didn't use it, so I wasted my money. Because the one day that generator goes on, it's worth it mm. that you had to have it. If, if you're three or four days, five days without power, 
and the generator is on those days, you can't look at it as oh, I wasted the other 361 days that I didn't need it. Mm. That's what insurance is for. You don't cancel your auto insurance because you haven't been in a car accident for a while. You have to have it. And you have yeah. to have you have to have those things because when you interview people who didn't, it sticks in your mind forever of, of how sad their story is and how much they lost or how inconvenienced they were. And you don't want to see people go through that. You certainly wouldn't want to go through it yourself. The mayor of Malibu told us, he goes, five years from now, this will just be a memory for people and they'll just be back living their lives, even though they were so disrupted by that fire. Yeah, that's... Um... That's, a, that's that's the part of the problem with emergency management, especially contracting. Like you kind of, in a one way, you have to be kind of a storm chaser. You have to let you have like the way our society's built is they don't want to focus on it until they have a problem. And like, what was that? That President Kennedy quote: "The best time to fix the roof is when it's sunny, mm -hmm. right? When the sun when the sun is shining." And so, like that's that's kind of my thought process there with that a little bit. Um, Man, there's I've got, a, I've got an interesting example for you. Uh, and this is an emergency management guy. This will, will get you. I talked to emergency managers about wanting to get them to do screenings of the film and we'll make it available to them so they can show their people and, and use it as a rallying cry. And a couple of the people I've spoken with said, yeah, we'll do it closer to hurricane season. And I just I wanted to just scream and I go, well, why don't we just wait till the fire starts and then we'll tell them how to put it out, you know, it's like or what to do. Mm -hmm. Isn't this the time to be doing that planning? Isn't this the time to get people to do that inspection of their house? If you wait till June to do it, it's too late. You got to yeah, do it now. Too... Oh, well, that's, that's the problem, right? Like understanding that our role is coordinators and people aren't going to take it seriously until there is a problem. And so that is like always, always like the catch 22 of like, I want to do it now. So people get a heads up so we can mitigate it effectively. But if I do it now and it's not on their radar, then they're going to think I'm a doomsday prepper and uh, they're going to see it as a waste of time. So I had to do it right when, right when the, the gray skies are developing. And so like, there's this, it's, it is frustrating. It is frustrating to like the nth degree when you're like, I know there's a, there's a problem. I can solve your problem. And, and, and this, in this case, it kind of, it's kind of the awareness is the problem. People just don't understand like what their hazards are and quite frankly, how easy it is to mitigate that generator. So yes, you can get the $30,000 whole house generator, but you can, if you have a Ford F-150, apparently in 2021, the guy was, you know, powering his house or, you know, so, oh my gosh, I was like, Ford, you need to be the, the official uh, emergency management truck, well, whatever. Um, there, you know, you can get a generator for $1,200 that essentially powers your, refrigerator and a couple of a couple of different small appliances right so if you have your if your refrigerator and you have insulin and you have two or three lights that you can turn on and maybe charge your phone especially if you have an external battery pack you will be miserable but if you're diabetic it could be life-saving you don't want that food oxygen to... people that are on oxygen tanks or any kind of medical device that you need that should be something that you go, that's, there's no question we need to have this. Absolutely. Yes. And, and it should be, we should make more ways to make that available to people because, you know, not everybody has the means to do it themselves. And so like, there's like a, a really important call out to, to one be, yes, finest, uh, fiscally responsible, but also if we're trying to, so this is probably the last point, right? If you want communities not to have to spend all this money fixing a problem, it's better to spend 10% of that and fix it now. And um, it's a call to politicians to kind of wake up a little bit. Uh, the NFIP kind of hurt, um, kind of hurt that cost share. And so we wait for the federal government to bail us out. That's not, that's not greatly if you're trying to think of people, right? Anyway, so we've had a lot of discussion on here about all the different ways that we could improve. Your documentary, The Last House Standing, is a great way for people to raise that awareness. Screw waiting till hurricane season. If you're an emergency manager right now, you should, one, watch the documentary. You can reach out to us. You can reach out, I'm sure, to, Dr., uh, to uh, George Siegel and say, hey, 
we're an emergency management group. We want to use it for awareness. If that's right, I'm yeah. probably, yeah. There's yep, a contact good. form on our website. They can fill Perfect. it out and we can arrange it. I want to just quickly give you a quote from Hank Ovink in the film. He goes, the simple lesson is that preparedness pays, that cleaning up after a disaster, repairing the damage, collecting your losses is a big effort, while a less bigger effort is to prepare better. And that's mm. so true. Just the three little pigs, we've all read that since we were kids, right? Which, which pig do you want to be? The guy that built the brick house and you know, had, a, had a plan. So it should, all, it, it, it should just click with people, do something, as we were saying. And yeah, we'll make the film available, absolutely. And um, I, I hope people will just go to the website and rent the film and, and see it at thelasthousestanding.org. It's, um, it's on there. And, you know, I hope it becomes a must see because I think it can wake people up to say, I'm going to do something. Yeah. And we'll put the last house standing.org on our show notes as well. So people can go to a link and so they can start uh, watching it themselves as well. Awesome. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. So um, obviously I super endorse the, do uh, support the documentary. I want people to watch it. Um, it helped my own awareness with my own family. And as an expert or as somebody who claims to have been doing this for a while, I got a lot out of it. I think it's great for the general public. I think it hits all those audiences very, very well. Obviously, we've been talking about it for a while now. And so there's lots of different ways we can start plugging gaps as emergency managers, as we work with policyholders, as we work with our community partners. And this is a, a great way to call that out. And so rent the movie, uh, take some action items from it, uh, contact George Siegel, contact us and say, Hey, this is how we're implementing it. I think that would make George the most happy to say like, Hey, I took something from this and I'm going to start using it. Um, if you want to learn more about George's, uh, movie, the last house standing is the documentary. Obviously you can go out to our show notes, of course, like I just said, but you can also learn more about it on our website, dobermanemg.com. You can check it out on our social media channels. We're going to be posting all about this episode for the next couple of days there. So make sure you like that. And then, of course, if you like this episode, you want to give us that five-star rating and subscribe. We'd really appreciate that. I, I have to say it one last time, George, thank you so much for coming onto the show. I mean, you're truly an expert in your craft, and it really shows throughout the conversation here. Well, thanks, John. I, I love the work you're doing. Um, I enjoy your show, and I, I appreciate you having me on. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Like I said, five-star rating and subscribe. If you want to contact George directly, you can do it through the show notes. We're going to be posting more about them on our social media channel, <laughs> Disaster Tough Podcast on Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, the whole deal. So make sure you're following us there for the latest updates, and we'll talk to you soon.